All right, today I want to go over our Firepunk Master Kit. This is something that uh, a lot of guys have been buying and assembling transmissions themselves. And originally this was designed for guys who had Firepunk transmissions and they wanted to refresh it. So it came with new frictions and steels, second gear band, did not come with a reverse band, all the paper rubber. So the paper rubber kit comes with all your gaskets seals, Teflon bushings, and it also comes with a uh, plate and bearing kit uh, for all the wear, common wear items. So it does not include hard parts. So if you take it apart and you have hard part damage, that's separate. You gotta tear your core down to find out what you need. That is your basic master kit. If you wanna add the competition master kit, that includes your billet second gear servo, billet accumulator piston, your billet apply lever, billet strut and billet anchor. So there's five billet pieces that get added to your competition master kit. But the frictions are the same between the regular master kit and the competition master kit. We use uh, Raybestos GPZ frictions uh, for the direct clutch, overdrive clutch, and the forward clutch. And then we use regular Raybestos for the overdrive direct. And this is also a Borg Warner flex band. Uh, this second gear band we've had really good luck with. It's a band that is not very expensive. You can buy billet second gear bands that are like $200 a piece. These are much more affordable and we have found them to hold almost as much horsepower as the billet bands. The problems with the billet bands is they're a lot more aggressive. They do have more holding power, but then once you do start slipping those billet rigid bands, they tend to tear up your direct drum. So when you have a band start slipping, then you're buying a, a new direct drum and a band. For the average consumer, this flex band is going to do everything that you're going to need it to do. So that is that also has 10 rivets as opposed to the factory eight. Uh, we've had some of the factory eight rivet bands break right here during second gear lock shifts. We've never had these bands break. Uh, bang for the buck, it's a good value. So the master kit comes with the Teflons. These are all common wear items that as long as your over overall end play is set up right, these things generally don't tear up that much, but they do wear. Once you have 100,000 miles on a transmission, you take them apart and you see some, some wear spots on them. So we do include that. If you take your transmission apart, I'm gonna go over some common areas of what you need to look as far as hard part replacement. So we're gonna go through this. I'm gonna open this kit up and we're gonna go by step by step anything that you need to address that's different from stock. Basically like the forward clutch is just replacing the clutches and making sure your clearance is right. You can follow the ATSG manual book on that. It's a very valuable piece to have if you're rebuilding a transmission and you're not familiar with the 47 and 48 REs. The overdrive clutch and the direct clutch, we provide a machine pressure plate to add an additional clutch to the directs and an additional clutch to the overdrives. And there's some changes that you need to look out for when you install these. So I'm gonna go over those changes with you today. Okay, one of the differences in the direct drum here, this is the where we're adding a clutch. It's very simple. The main thing is that we get our clearances correct. So when you take the stock um, snap ring out, you'll notice that it is a wavy snap ring. So if you pull the snap ring out, you can see in the, uh, it's got a little bit of a wave in it and they did that so that it cushions the apply. And we're going, but that also, tends to tighten up your clearance a little bit because it makes the clutch apply just a little bit sooner. So to get rid of that um, or to add an extra clutch is this is the factory pressure plate and this is the machine pressure plate and snap ring that comes with the master kit. So you can see the differences in the thickness um, between the two and we try to take as little material off this pressure plate as possible because if you take too much material off of this and as the as the clutches apply from here, you get deflection. And if you get deflection in this pressure plate, then you're not gonna get an even clutch apply and you're actually gonna lose holding power. So this, it's key on, when, if you do machine a pressure plate, uh, that you keep as much material in there as possible. We're actually in the process of having these manufactured. It's gonna infect the master kit price a little bit because they're gonna be close to $50 a piece. Uh, just to manufacture the new plates, but it's going to be from a harder material, less deflection, it's going to make even better holding power. And the problems that we have is these pressure plates are hard to find and often they get torn up and then we're always buying all the uh, pressure plates out of cores and we run out of inventory. So you do away with the stock pressure plate that's fully machined and then you can add another clutch and steel. And then add the machine pressure plate and then the new snap ring is non-wavy. This goes in, 
And now we are ready to check for our direct drum clearance, and I'll show you how to do that. This is probably the easiest way to do it if you have a dial indicator. If you have feeler gauges that are angled, you can actually get it pretty close with a feeler gauge, but when you're going in between the pressure plate and the friction, you're likely to actually tear up the clutch. You have to be real careful not to tear up your clutch if you're using a feeler gauge between. But what I like to do is I put this together, I push it down, zero the dial indicator, and then I just pull up on the friction. And right there I got about 84 thou of clearance. And really, these frictions, you can run these anywhere as tight as 75 thousandths if you're not doing a lot of lock two, three shifts. If you're wanting to do lock two, three shifts, we'd set them up generally in the 85 range. So pretty much between 80 and 90 thousandths. Uh, you'll notice in the ATSG book, it gives you a pretty wide range. And the looser you set the clearance in here, the more delay you're gonna have in the two, three shift timing. So if you've got a, a 5.0 apply lever like a stock 48RE does, and you have a sonic servo that's really tight in your second gear servo, those don't tend to release as fast. You're gonna to need to set up this clearance a little bit looser, closer to 95 thousandths. But for our master kit with our competition master kit with the TCS second gear servo and the second gear servo spring that we send along, we generally set them up right around 85 thousandths and that seems to work well. And there are variations between drums. In-house here, we have selective snap rings that from 62 thousandths thickness all the way up to 105 thousand thickness that we can change the clearance of the drum by just popping a different snap ring in. It makes it really easy. You guys don't have that luxury at home in your garage. I see a lot of guys, they take their transmission apart and they get their master kit and they're doing it on a Saturday or a Sunday and they put it together and their clearance is not what they want it to be. Then you have to call, you have to order a selective snap ring and to get the correct clearance that you want. That's some of the disadvantages of doing it at home if you're not doing it on a regular basis and don't have a setup where you have all these clearances. But it is important if you end up on the tight side of your clearance, you're a lot more likely to get a two, three shift bind where the second gear band is still slightly applied onto this drum when it shifts from second gear to third gear. And that kind of gives you the feeling like it throws you forward in your seat when it shifts from second to third. And then when you do that with the lockup, on, now it actually is slipping the clutch. Something's got to give. So when the converter's unlocked, the converter can absorb that cushion. Generally doesn't hurt anything with the clutch for just doing it a couple times. Not a big deal, but when you're doing lock shifts and you have a tight direct drum clearance and a really tight second gear servo with a 5.0 apply lever, then you end up with a problem. You end up with a burned second gear band. So what we often recommend doing is setting this up at 85 thousandths and then we also keep, uh, we like to run the 4.2 billet apply lever that comes in our competition master kit. And that reduces the leverage on the second gear apply a little bit from the factory 5.0 apply ratio. And that gives us a nice clean 2-3 shift. One other trick I'd like to show you guys that I did uh, for a long time building these, like we've got nice transmission stands now that we can flip our case real easy when we're building. But when I was building these transmissions in a milk parlor and I didn't have the luxuries that I do now, I would always put my converter on the table. I take my uh, pump, flip it over, and you can spline that on the gear set like that. And then you can take your direct drum and put it on here like this. And you've got a good place to work and you can see right where it's working. One thing that to watch on these direct drums is this sealing ring right here seals on these two seals right here. And this is very critical on where the, when the valve body applies direct drum, third gear, then it puts fluid between these two seals. So if you have any grooving in the direct drum in here, if you can take your finger and feel it, uh, pretty much if you can feel it with your fingernail, it's probably 10 thousandths. And that's gonna be enough that it can cause a leak and it will leak enough fluid back into the sump that your direct drum will not be getting full mainline pressure. Even if you have a 200 PSI valve body, your direct drum might only be getting 170 PSI and you're not gonna have as much holding power. So those are things in rebuilds that it's important to just watch that and make sure that you don't have any unusual wear in here. If so, you need to replace the drum. But this gives you the ability to put the thing on here and then we can actually take compressed air to the, uh, to the direct drum port of the pump and we can apply the drum and then we can make sure our inner and outer piston seals are actually sealed and we didn't pinch them going in because it's a lip seal and they're faced out. So when you go in, you have to wiggle them gently down in there with assembly goo on it. If you don't do that and you roll the seal up, 
and then you're going to apply air and you're going to hear a bunch of air hiss out past the seals and you know that you're going to install the trains and not have third gear. So that's a quick way to do an air check on your, basically double check your work before you assemble this into the case itself. We also send a new direct drum bushing for the direct drum and it takes a bushing driver to knock this out and set it back in. Most of the time these bushings come out, they don't look too bad, but we always send a new one because if this bushing wears, it will leak off pressure. So the bushing's there, change it if you have any kind of excessive wear in the bushing. Okay, then there's one other thing with the direct drum that comes in these rebuild kits. Um, there are two inner seals that are both made for the inside of the direct drum. And if you look, the factory one, you can see the lip on the inside of here is thinner than this. The thicker seal is the one that you want on the inside. The stock one was made for stock line pressure and when you add go from 150 PSI line pressure to 200 PSI and you have the thin lip seal in there, it can actually blow the fluid right past this seal and you can lose hold, holding power as well. So always make sure you find the two seals, compare them and run the thicker of the two seals for the inside of the direct drum. That's pretty much all I have for the direct drum on our master kit. Those are the things to look for. If you do that, you should have a solid third gear. Third gear is, or direct drum is on in third gear, and then it stays on for overdrive. Overdrive just brings the overdrive clutch on and puts the uh, 0 0.69 to one overdriven third gear. So if you understand that, you know that if you have slipping in overdrive and you pull your overdrive apart and the overdrive clutches are perfect, it could be the direct clutch slipping. So I always like to try to get a good understanding of what my clutches are actually doing. And that way when you're driving the truck after you're all done, it's easier to diagnose a problem when you actually have an understanding of what's applied in what gear. The next clutch that's in our uh, master kit that I'm gonna go over is the forward clutch, or they call it the rear clutch. So it's called the forward clutch because it's applied in every manual or every forward gear. And this is a good way, again, on this stack up to get all these splines allowed and uh, aligned and it makes it really easy to put in your pump assembly. And this forward clutch is the stock 48RE uh, procedure, or 47RE, they're both the same. The only difference in the 47 and 48 is the 48RE's have the thin uh, teeth on the inside. That's a 48RE forward clutch, like this. 47RE, have a bigger teeth. Here you can see the bigger teeth is for a 47 RE and the finer teeth are for a 48 RE. So if you have a 48 RE, we've seen like back in the day, a lot of the 48 RE planetaries were really hard to get and people would tear up a 48 RE planetary set and then they would actually replace it with 47 RE five pinion planets and then they'd have to run a 47 RE clutch. So if you take a 48RE apart and it has the bigger clutches in it, that means it probably has a five pinion uh, 47RE planetary set in it. We see it quite a bit in cores that come in. And now there's finally aftermarket parts available to upgrade all these things with replacing with six pinion planets. And we can get everything back to the 48RE stack up that it was designed to be from the get go. As far as the rest of the forward clutch, this is uh, the piston in the back of the input shaft. You can follow the ATSG book. Uh, and get this forward clutch put back together. Pretty much when you put this together, uh, the main things to look for on the forward clutch is you have to remember that this clutch is applied in every forward gear, so it is only disengaged in park, neutral, and reverse. So as long as this clutch pack is loose enough that you can turn the clutch pack by hand, it's probably loose enough that it's not gonna drag the clutch in uh, park or neutral. So we generally shoot for about 20 thou clearance in the forward clutch. That gives you some room. So I can turn that clutch by hand and even without measuring I can tell there's 20 thou clearance in there. Um, we usually measure them anyway but just for the sake of time if you can reach in there and turn that clutch by hand um, it is probably loose enough to not drag the clutch because the only mistake you can make with the forward clutch is get it set up too tight because then your truck's sitting in park and you can actually, or yeah, park neutral and you can drag the forward clutch um, when it's not engaged in forward. But forward comes on in first gear. This is the clutch pack that you launch your truck in in first gear. If you brake boost your truck, you're at a stoplight, 
and you spool up to 20 pounds of boost trying to race the Mustang beside you and the light doesn't change for two minutes, this clutch pack will get so hot it will friction weld itself together and all gears will be forward. Neutral will go forward, first will go forward, and reverse will be a trains brake. These clutches, the forward clutch is robust. It very seldom fails if the clearances and line pressure set up right. Pretty much if you weld them together, usually it's pretty much stupid is as stupid does. Like you have to be pretty hard on your truck to weld the forwards together. Okay, so now you have your forward clutch, direct clutch done, your second gear band, the way it works, it comes around here and it actually applies onto your third gear drum. That's why your two, three shift timing is so critical uh, because if your second gear band doesn't release fast enough, it's dragging on the, or it is still applied to the outside when the inside clutch engages and starts spinning the drum. And that is also why second gear lockup. I tell guys, I mean, we do it all the time when we race, but we don't do it more than we have to because put $20 in the piggy bank every time you do second gear, second to third gear lock because it will catch up to you sooner or later because this shift timing is harder on this, on this uh, band itself because it has, uh, when the converter's locked, there is no cushion to absorb any kind of uh, shift timing issues and the 47 and 48s it's all hydraulic fluid applying this and as the fluid temperature viscosity changes your shift timing will change a little bit so you can get a transmission shifting right that's why when we race it we try to not just start it up cold and go up and make it look cold it's nice to get the fluid temperature up to about 100 degrees before you go make passes that way your fluid's not really thick and you can you're more likely to get a shift tie up Okay, next is the overdrive clutch. And so in the master kit, you'll see that you get a pressure plate. And again, it's machined. That's for added clearance. So we can aim, add six clutches. That will gain you, every time you add a clutch, you're gaining surface area and that gains you a percentage of holding power. Okay, the stock setup has the unmachined pressure plate and then it has a wavy snap ring and a solid snap ring. And what you're gonna do, you're gonna take the stock pressure plate out. You're gonna take both snap rings out and you're going to take the wavy snap ring and you're gonna discard it. You're just gonna set it aside. We're not gonna reinstall that. And then you just take this solid snap ring and you re reinstall this down in the case itself to make sure it's seated correctly. And then we take the machine pressure plate and the machine part of the pressure plate sits against the solid non-wavy snap ring. And now between the material we've machined off the plate and the leaving the wavy snap ring out, we've made room for one more clutch. So now we can go ahead and install friction steel, friction steel, and get a total of six frictions in the overdrive clutch. And that's going to give you added holding capacity. And that's the main difference between a stock setup and our Firepunk Master Kit overdrive setup. And these are the GPZ frictions. And again, the things, do's and don'ts of an overdrive is a lot of people will tear up an overdrive clutch and don't know why. An overdrive is the biggest gear RPM drop in a 47 or 48 RE. You see almost a thousand RPM drop when it brings on the overdrive clutch. So if you are doing a lock shift and you're at 3000 RPM, it's going to drop to 2000 RPM. And that's right where it makes peak torque. So when guys do a burnout, Often when it grabs overdrive, it tries to go from 90 mile an hour wheel speed to 120 mile an hour wheel speed. The engine doesn't have enough horsepower, bogs the engine, and the clutch is trying to apply as RPMs are coming down, line pressure comes down, and that actually slips the clutch. I always tell guys, if you're gonna do hood rat stuff, uh, you can have plenty of fun in third gear. Just turn overdrive off, and you're gonna protect this clutch because lugging it low RPMs in overdrive or that high torque scenario when it draws it down into overdrive, that's the hardest that you can be on the clutch. If you can make, I mean, we can, we use overdrive all the time racing, shifting at 4,200 RPM, drops it to 3,200 RPM, line pressure stays high, everything is good, overdrive clutch holds no problem. It's usually just those uh, shenanigan, uh, odd scenarios. It's a lot of the full manual valve body guys. They're banging switches and doing everything they like to do inside the cab, tear stuff up. So you just have to understand the differences in what you're actually doing when you're driving these things to know how to protect the overdrive clutch. These are the actual official tools that you need for measuring the overdrive clearances and overall end play. So there's a couple different ways that you can do it. 
But if you don't have these, like you can take a, a piece of straight flat bar, and measure the thickness of your flat bar and measure down and get your clearances right. You can see here where we have all of our selective overdrive spacers that go between the Torrington bearing and the overdrive. And that is what sets your your overdrive clearance, basically how, when the piston fluid starts coming in, how fast it starts engaging the overdrive clutch. Because you have these 10, these are called the overdrive direct clutch, and these sit down in here. And they are actually held by an 800 pound spring in the overdrive section, and these are engaged all the time in park, reverse, neutral, first, second, and third. The only time these are released is when overdrive is on. So the job of these clutches is to keep the overdrive planetary from spinning until the overdrive clutch up here is engaged. Once this overdrive clutch engages, it presses down on the center, which releases the, these clutches. So if your clearance isn't right, then it can uh, engage the main overdrive clutch and it's dragging the overdrive direct clutch and you will actually have an overdrive failure because your truck is having to, your overdrive clutch is having to do a bunch of extra work because it's dragging these clutches. So it's very critical that you follow the ATSG manual on getting your overdrive clearance set correctly. And again, we have all these selective shims. If you don't have those and it's not right, it's worth your time to give us a call. We'll send you the correct shim. Uh, it's going to slow your build down for a day or two, but you need to make sure your overdrive clearances are correct. If not, you're going to have a premature failure and you're going to be doing it again. And eventually you'll be an expert because you didn't do it right the first time. One other thing to keep in mind, these overdrive sections are known for wearing back here. This snap ring right here rides on your uh, big bearing that goes on your output shaft. And this snap ring actually wears into the case that wear as it wears if you start at 32 thousandths end play and it wears into the case 20 thou now you have 52 thou end play so i see a lot of guys who don't notice that and they check their end play they set it up right and the case is worn real bad and then as soon as you actually get real load on it from a hard shift it pushes it back now your transmission you thought you had set up and clearance correctly has excessive play so there are kits that sonics makes that shim that that's supposed to help repair the case, um, but if it's too bad, you have to replace the overdrive section. In overdrive sections, there are some aftermarket ones available. We've had some problems with uh, the way they fit in the overdrive clutch on the aftermarket ones. We usually just try to find good core replacements. Um, this is why cores are so valuable to us because Dodge doesn't make these things anymore. It's only the aftermarket world. A lot of the stuff is coming from overseas. Quality control is not the same that it was originally. If you can find a good Mopar case, hang on to it because we're gonna need it because we have a lot of guys who break the ears off these case right here because they run their drive shafts with a bad U-joint or the carrier bearings or the drive shafts just playing out of balance. And this whole overdrive section is getting a jump rope effect done to it and this aluminum section right in here is the first place that fails and they always call us and say hey our transmission's leaking and we they think it's a pan because it runs down on the lip of the pan down here and then we figure out that it's a hairline crack in here so anytime when we install the trans we roll around the u-joints we try to make extra take extra care to make sure we don't catch it and one thing when we rebuild these we're always looking for if it's wet down here there's often a hairline crack but there has been a time or two that we've sent these things out and we've missed a hairline crack because you physically can't see it with your eyes, but when you put fluid on it, it leaks. If that's the case, and then it's unfortunate, but the only way to fix it is to pull it and change that overdrive case. That's pretty much it for the overdrive in our master kit. If you do that, uh, you should be all set. Uh, I will say on this clutch here, uh, we have one steel in here that's like 15 thousandths thicker. We put that right in the center. Um, it adds a little bit of clearance here, and we also tend to tighten up the overdrive clutch clearance when we're measuring here by 10 thou, and that just makes the clutch come on just a little bit sooner. Um, that, that has worked out fairly well for us, but if you follow the ATSG book and keep it within those factory specs, you're going to get your overdrive clearance correctly. If you want to add 10 thou clearance to this, um, to this uh, measurement from the ATSG book, you're gonna be all right. So if you get in that, in that window, you're gonna be all right on your clearance. The next thing I wanna go over is, this is just for some advice on rebuilding your trans. 
your overdrive piston support, this goes on the back of your transmission. Uh, your overdrive piston is in here, coming out here. You gotta make sure that this lip seal is polished nice and shiny. If you have any kind of catches or rubbing on there, then as your piston goes back and forth, it's a lot more likely to eventually tear your overdrive seal and you'll have a over premature overdrive failure. Also check to make sure that this check ball uh, doesn't come out um, or this little screen. There's two things on the factory one that sometimes come out. But the most common reason that we replace this is strictly because there's galling on here because this goes through your case on the overdrive section and then this is your reverse band. Your sprag goes on the reverse band here and then this is how it rides in here. And so your reverse drum is always spinning. It's steel, steel on aluminum. So I always look right here where this lube hole is, and if this aluminum is, is run over into that uh, machined area at all, you should replace this. And then also inspect the inside carefully, because if your intermediate shaft has galled up on the overdrive piston support, what happens is the, the aluminum will gall and it will, it will block these lube holes. And if it blocks the lube hole, then there's no lubrication going on this, uh, this uh, ceiling surface here and it will start just wreaking havoc on that whole thing and then it ends up blocking the lube hole going back to your overdrive section you have a failure in your overdrive your planetaries get really hot because you're not lubing the back and this is another thing that often happens when your coolers do not get flushed correctly a lot of guys don't have a hot flush machine and they just put a transmission in their driveway and roll on and they don't have any problems but the guys that have a problem are the ones that have contaminated coolers Say you broke an input shaft on your stock trans and send a bunch of crap into your cooler system and while your truck was hot and now your coolers cool down and all the fins will actually contain all those little metal contaminants and then you drive your truck with a brand new transmission as soon as your cooler expands again it releases all those metal contaminants goes right back in the rear port of the transmission which is fed directly to the overdrive piston support and now all those little metal contaminants come in here and they run between the uh, intermediate shaft and the aluminum overdrive piston support and on the reverse drum to piston support and now your brand new transmission with 50 miles on it is already starting a problem that you really probably won't see in the first 500 miles you're not going to see your heat problems and blockage problems for a couple thousand miles but then you're going to call me in a couple months and be like Levon I'm having a problem my transmission's overheating it's not acting right and we pull the thing apart and it's all galled up in here. And when in reality, it's not really a workmanship issue. It's the, the problem was install air and whoever installed it didn't do their due diligence getting their coolers clean. So those are things that people don't realize how important it is to get their coolers clean because they're just like, ah, it's a little bit of crap, it'll go back in the pan. When in reality, whatever comes out of the cooler gets fed in the case and directly right onto the aluminum overdrive piston support. It is very important that your coolers are clean on a new transmission install. Okay, these are this is your planetary set, your forward planet, your rear planet. You can see this is a five pinion 47 RE. The 48 REs will be six pinion. And this is where you can, this is where we get to all our uh, plate and bearing kits, or our thrust washers, That's your intermediate shaft. So there's your your planet, this is the outer race. Here you can start seeing some of this wear. In reality, there's no, there's no material actually being dragged into these little ports. Very common to see this little bit of discoloration, but what you don't wanna see is when it is actually galling and tearing this up. But that's why we always send our new, uh, we send our new thrust bearing kit with our master kit so that you can change all these and have these new. And there's a plate and there's a thrust washer between every uh, planet and race and the sun shell. And you can see this is how the 47 REs, the 48 REs are a little bit different back here. But those are all things that you just make sure, like this is an aluminum planetary. If your overdrive clip or your, if your overall end play is too tight, then you see this plate right here will actually wear down into the aluminum and it'll tear this up. And that's why we often upgrade these to the steel planetary, um, the 
47 REs all had the aluminum planetaries. If your clearances are correct, your unplay clearance is correct. Honestly, on a under 700 horsepower truck, the aluminum planets very seldom do fail. The 47 RHs have an aluminum front planet and those won't hold more than like 400 horsepower. They, they strip the splines out right there. You only have reverse when that happens. It's a bad deal. If you have an aluminum forward planet, throw it away as fast as you can, get a steel one. Ideally, the six pinion 48 REs are the best planetary set that's out there. Uh, but again, sometimes availability is tough with this stuff. So as far as hard parts go, you know, when we tear apart these cores, you have your sun shell, uh, you have your planetaries, your forward planet, rear planet, you have your reverse drum that gets galled up and you need a reverse drum. We have all those parts in stock. Um, we are working towards having drop down items on our website where all these core pieces will be in stock. Um, we're not putting them on the website until we have plenty of inventory right now with the COVID delay. Um, we are fighting with our suppliers on getting parts. Everybody's dealing with this stuff. And normally I can call an order 50 and they show up, but recently I call an order 50 and five show up. And so I'm not putting them on the website until uh, they're readily available because we really are just barely keeping up with what we're building in house. As time goes on, you're going to see these on our website. You'll be able to go on there and just click and buy as you see if you need hard parts for forward drum, direct drum, uh, sun shell, planetary, overdrive piston support, any of those hard parts, those will be on the Firepunk website. You can visit shop.firepunk.com, go to the transmission section under your year of truck and we'll have all the parts available, including our master kit. In the beginning, I missed, I also have the pump bushing that we always, we always replace the pump bushing in uh, when we do a rebuild, even if it's just a refresh, because your converter wears on this pump. And if this clearance gets more than like three thou, you'll start having a lot more problems with converter drain back where the truck sits overnight and the converter, top half of the fluid in the converter will siphon back into the pan. You start your truck up, drop it and drive, and it doesn't move. And the reason is, is your clutch is engaged, but your converter has an air pocket in it and it has to pump itself full back up with, with fluid. So if you have drain back, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem. It just means your clearance has opened up in here and it allows a siphon to start. And most guys have that problem with the, uh, with aftermarket coolers with no check ball. The factory check ball in the cooler system does help to keep that siphon from starting. So once you go to an aftermarket cooler, you are more likely to have drain back, but keep a fresh uh, pump bushing in it, direct drum bushing. And then all of the, like we send uh, the snap ring that generally fits with all that, but there are some variances in your snap rings. So if you need uh, snap rings, thrust washers, like, these are the different thrust washers that you can get. This sets your clearance from your direct drum to your pump and between your input shaft and direct drum. Those are all things that are critical to make sure that your clearances are right. We've got all these selectives here. If you need some, give us a call. Tell us what the ATSG book is telling you that you need, and we will be able to send out the right part. Do not call me and ask me what thrust bearing you need because I'm not working on your transmission and I won't know. So you need to be able to take some measurements, look at your ATSG book and say, I need a 120 thou um, Teflon washer that goes on your, on your pump or I need um, a 72 thou direct drum snap ring. You know, you can actually tell us what you need. We can send it to you, but we have people who call us and they're like, hey, what, what, what do I need to change my clearance? I'm like, I don't know, it's not in front of me. So I hope this helps. Um, we uh, are here to help in any way we can. Sometimes some of this technical advice is a little bit hard to give over the phone, but if you guys have questions with our kit, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, but you see what you get, the normal master kit is all the wearable parts. The competition master kit includes the billet servo, strut, anchor, and accumulator piston and apply lever. And combined, you'll still need a valve body. Valve bodies is something that we've actually taken off of our website recently because we are having a hard time keeping up with the valve bodies, just what we have in house. And we're gonna be putting them back on the website as we get caught back up. Uh, we're just trying to not outsell. Like right now we're a couple weeks out and we're trying to do everything we can to staff up and keep everything going. So. Hope this helps. If you guys got any questions, call the shop, 614-733-3744, or shoot me an email, lavon at firepunk.com. If you got any technical questions on a trans, I'd be glad to answer it.